we've established to sure. make those more resilient. This is for places where the means are of lesser. Uh, but it says low income geographic area including locality within a locality has a median alpha income. There's not very many birds. Yeah. 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 So the, the loan forgiveness is only if the locality as a whole has less than 80%. I think, I think my understanding is money goes from the locality to these individuals, right? So my, my I would have to take a closer look at the later, but my understanding is if the applicant, whether it's an individual or, or community scale initiative, is within that low income, <laughs> then, they, then they would be eligible for that forgiveness. Well, the blocks and one more question. Well, well, I just want to make sure we're clear because this is a, a fund that has been there but unfunded. And it's, it's a loan not only to to anyone living in a flood prone area. So anyone could ask for the loan. The only reason you get loan forgiveness is if you were in a low income area is the way I would. Well, the community can do it as a whole or you can do it individually. So it's low income geographic and local. I'm talking about the fund itself. Uh, are there folks in the public who'd like to speak in favor of the bill? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Jay Ford, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, we support this measure. As many of you know, um, climate change and the result of the current flooding, sea level rise, are a major issue for, for us here in coastal Virginia. And we have lots of communities that have. Um, almost insurmountable issues like to the northern neck, western shore, the eastern shore, and parts of the South Hampton Roads. There are many, many, many communities that would fall into this category. And we have very limited resources for what we can do for folks that are impacted by these rising seas. And those resources that we do have are disproportionately weighted towards those that have the means. And so this is an important tool to help bring some equity to this process to those folks that um, also have a right to stay where they are. And we also have language in here that includes nature-based solutions, which is really important as that takes into consideration the uh, water quality impacts as well. So we would uh, encourage you to support this measure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, we also have the conservation voters. We also support the bill. Again, it produces um, about $40 million a year to help solve Thank you. And Sean, do you show of trust? Be shocked to believe that I support the bill after talking about it. But um, <laughs> just really appreciate uh, the chair and the subcommittee taking it up and, and answering questions. All right. Anyone from oh, the public would like to speak in opposition to the bill? All right. To report the substitute. <laughs> Sorry. We report and substitute the substitute and yeah. properly seconded. Yeah, and report. report and report report. to appropriation. Um, all right, properly moved and seconded. Um, so I'll vote on the. Uh, sure, All right, electronics. Well, too bad you got to It's a real problem. It's a real problem. It's a real problem. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Let me just give you a quick <coughs> overview about the impetus for this bill, and I'll get into the changes for the substitute as folks are having a chance to look at it. Uh, Virginia's waterways directly impact the health of our environment and our communities. In the 42nd District, parts of my di uh, district are bordered by the Aquapon and the Potomac, so we're intimately um, uh, familiar with the importance of water, both for recreation and uh, enjoyment, as well as for our, um, its importance to our health. Um, in 2012, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency released their National Toxics Release Inventory report showing that industrial facilities in Virginia dumped over 18 million pounds of toxic chemicals into our waterways, the second highest amount in the nation. Although water pollution in Virginia has decreased in the eight years since then, there's still significant room for improvement. For example, EPA data from 2018 shows these same industrial facilities dumped over 9 million pounds of toxic chemicals in our, into our waterways. So this bill is about making sure that people and our <coughs> communities understand when unpermitted spills are um, occurring in our waterways. And so I think first and foremost about my constituents along the Aquapon and the Potomac, if they want their dogs swimming in the water, if they want to be boating, if they want to be fishing, what is important to know? And um, we have a substitute because since we introduced the bill, we have worked <coughs> with a multitude of stakeholders to try to kind of thread this needle. And uh, and I hope that we've reached some, some good agreement. Um, so I originally had proposed an eight hour kind of clock to let, uh, to start the clock when a spill has been discovered to when the, um, when DEQ would have to be notified. We then quickly realized within an eight hour span, there may actually not be any daylight. So we wanted to be reasonable. The Clean Water Act sets 24 hours as a floor. There are states that are far more aggressive than even 12 hours uh, with one coming in saying all notifications happen to have happen to need to happen within one hour, right? So we wanted to be reasonable um, and think that within 12 hours there should be some ample daylight um, to really understand what the situation is. Um, the other change we made, we were asked, you know, what if there was a situation where there was like a state of emergency and everybody's workforce and attention was turned elsewhere. We wanted to uh, do an exemption in those instances where a state of emergency has been declared in that local community. We revert back to the 24-hour timeline that is, uh, at, you know, instituted by the Federal Clean Water Act. And also, just a realization that just because you know when the spill occurs the first time, it's not as if uh, the lines of communication with DEQ then close once you make that initial uh, notification. It continues to stay open as, as you, you know, as the entity kind of understands the situation better. Um, so you'll see that. The le next big change is in lines <coughs> 93 through 102, and I think this is really the substance of the matter. Previously, if there was water, um, a spillage, then we were required to be notified via newspaper. I think we all know that, uh, you know, I still get the print newspaper in my house, but many uh, communities no longer have a local newspaper, one that's printed regularly, and many folks no longer get their news from the newspaper anymore. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a wide a variety of communication channels that will be used to reach communities that are affected. And also just to make sure that these social media accounts are the official accounts of DEQ. Um, secondly, I think what was in the code before and what is different we're proposing now is, is before if there was a spill, you had to notify DEQ within 24 hours, um, DEQ would then work with the Virginia Department of Health to determine if the spill uh, had detrimental effects on public health. And that could take several days based on the types of bacteria and the tests and waiting for the results. And it might be the at the end of the day that there's no notification made because the spill has you know, been diluted into a large body of water. Um, but during that time, my constituents and yours might not want their dog to be swimming in that water. They might not want to be boating. They might not want to be fishing. So how do we strike that right balance to let people know that there's a situation while those tests are being uh, undertaken? And so what we've worked to try to balance both a concern around kind of too much notification and of being alarmist with having enough information to make decisions about how you spend your recreational and other times in the water is to say that unless DEQ uses good judgment, 
um, sound judgment, which we expect them to do in their daily jobs anyway, they will notify us unless they say, you know, this is just a teaspoon of X or a gallon of X and it's gonna be okay. Um, and then of course, when VDH does their testing, if, the, if it comes back um, as being detrimental to our public waters, then they will, uh, DEQ will update that notification. Thank you, Delegate Tran. Any questions from the committee? Delegate Guy. So we're coming in from 24 to 12, and I have a letter from the HRSD when it was eight saying that it, is, it, it will be a large administrative burden on them because it spills occur on Saturday night from the 4th of July. Um, it will be hard to be in compliance. Um, they already have a 24 hour, and they always need it. According to the letter, they always need eight hours if it's during regular business hours. I mean, it convinced me that the benefit to public health is sufficient to offset the administrative burden and the corresponding increase in cost of repairs from sewer. I'm sorry, could you say what H? I know. Hampton Road Sanitation District. Oh, okay, cool. Um, all right, so first of all, let me just clarify, it's not eight, the clock doesn't start when the spill occurs, it only starts when you've discovered there is a spill. So recognizing there might be a spill of some type, um, employees aren't there, you know, on site, it's after hours and such. So it starts when you've discovered the spill, right? And I think that's an important clarification to make. Um, and even then, I think what's important is that we want to make sure that we're taking action accordingly. And if they're able to make 24 hours, they're able to make eight, then making sure that the public has a chance to be aware because in that <coughs> if we're talking about sanitation i think we would all want to know if there's poop in the water before our dogs are swimming in that river dogs are swimming in the aquapon of the potomac or whatnot right like i think this is just thinking about um, how do we balance that notification with our own usage of these waterways and what's happening to the fish and other uh you know other um animals and fauna in the waterways. And so I think that's that's it. It's just starting to make sure that we're notified. And also a reminder, it's not just the clock that starts, it's who and how people are notified as well. Yeah, I so I, can I just yeah. interrupt here for a second? Um, could the, the members of the committee uh, please direct all of your questions to the chair? I'm sorry. All right. um, any other questions for the patrons? Delegate Helen. Mr. Chair, uh, I would ask the, the delegate, can, can you Clarify a little bit, just so I understand in plain English, the notification requirement today, and how the, I, I'm still trying to understand a little bit how this functionally changes it. Not just the because you said you mentioned the timeline, and I see that there's that on social media and all that. Kind of stuff. I'm still trying to understand, like how it happens Delegate today. Trent? Yeah. What, 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 yes, Mr. Chairman. With all due respect, would it be appropriate, maybe for an agency head, to talk about what, what is, has currently been done historically forever? Could be. Um, just, just uh, once we get there. I was, okay. Ms. Chair, I would draw my question. I would be very, I would be very amenable to that. Right. I think there's somebody from DEQ there. Someone from DEQ question. might want to speak to this. I'm sorry. What, How, what, what is the question? current process? Um, Mr. Chairman, member of the committee, David Paylor with DEQ. The current process is when we get the notification, we contact the health department. The health department determines whether or not there um, is a public health risk. I'm sorry, could you clarify how you notify the public? Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, we notify the newspapers and put it on our um, website. And at the beginning of days, we also um, uh, use Twitter and some of those other kinds of notifications. Thank you, sir. Delegate follow up. I guess a quick question for, for Director Taylor. Because um, yeah, the, the vast majority of these spills aren't going to be um, big spills and River, they're, they're going to be, uh, you know, five or ten gallons of, of you know, fuel oil that uh, have got out of the tank and are heading towards a storm drain. And so, um, I, I, I guess I'm struggling in terms of the, of the 12 hours because usually you know, their, their first response is, "Oh no, I've got to notify DEQ." Uh, their first response is, "I got to clean this up. I got to coordinate with local hazmat. I got to call my own local health department." And so. I think that was the old language, you know, which is, and, you know, if we move forward with this, I think we want to reinsert it as properly notified. I think the expectation is that, that you do it as fast as humanly possible. 
but that the, the initial response in controlling it is, is your primary primary target. I, I'm interested in terms of whether you think 12 hours is, is enough time in order to reasonably allow a property, an industrial site, to get control of the situation and make sure they get that information. It's going to vary by, uh, by the spill, but um, I would say that uh, uh, that the notification itself um, uh, probably uh, can come in advance of you know finishing any um, any capturing of it or any anything like that. Delegate Gilbert, so what time do you open and what time do you close? Uh, we open at. Seven o'clock, and we close it. If the general assembly is not in session, no, we close no. it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we close it probably six or six thirty. Uh, we do have um, twenty-four hour notification, and so we have people. Well, that's what I was wondering. Who, who, how does somebody from the public, like they spill no, something? Don't. Sorry, sorry about that. How do they know who to call? What, what, is, what is the? Well, the folks who um, have permits with us. Um, have that information in the department about who, who to call. Elder oh, Gilbert? Yeah, other. And does this only apply to people that are subject to those permits? Um, I believe, it, no, it does not only apply to them. So, um, so others might not have immediate information on how to get in touch with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kelly um, <coughs> Speaking to the fecal call form that she was talking about, um, the Department of Health, I think it's important that she's got that on there too. So I don't want to just um, talk about DEQ. So you've got, um, you know, if there were a spill or something, I think it's important that we have, um, you know, several hours for the department, for the agency to, be, to get the information, be able to go out there and assess, and then get the information back out once they've tested it, whatever it could be. Do you have an amendment, Kelly Rensselaer? No, I'm just making it. Okay. Anyone uh, speak in favor of the bill? Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, Anna Kelly of the James River Association. We support the bill. We support notification of those who are out there using the river. Um, so they know whether uh, the conditions so that they can make a choice on um, whether to go out and enjoy the resource. Stephen Carter Lovejoy with the uh, Virginia Sierra Club, and we think it's important to be as, as uh, upfront as possible. I know the timing is very difficult, but I think it's worth uh, it's worth making as strict as can happen. Thank you, sir. Pat Calvert, Virginia Conservation Network. Um, thank you both delegates for for bringing this bill together. Uh, the public has a right to know there's a um, when there's a discharge um, that could affect their health in the body of water. So we appreciate this effort. Thank you, Miss. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I'm Grace from LCD, and we support this bill. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, yeah. members of the committee, Peggy Sanders, Chesley Bay Foundation, I want to thank both um, Chairman Lopez and Delegate uh, Tran for bringing this thought to the bill. Thank you. This is Billy Fuller, if I could. This is for Director Paler again. Um, <coughs> just trying to make sure I understand how you would practically implement this. Um, what would, what would your process be for determining whether something was de minimis? And so, for instance, like I said, the vast majority of these are things that, um, you know, they're going to be, you know, 10, 20, 30 gallons. It's not good. Uh, but, but I also think, you know, what's going to happen is you're going to have a void cry bolt kind of situation if you're loading up social media and newspapers um, and then people ignore the bigger things that we ought to so I, I want to see what your definition of de minimis would be. Um, well, um, I think that's something we're still going to have to work out. Um, uh, we don't have a position on the bill, but I, I think we would um, want to work it out in such a way that um, uh, that if there was no reasonable um, a risk to public health, that we would um, not alarm the public. Uh, just one quick question for, for myself. Uh, Director Taylor, how many rivers, uh, streams, tributaries in Virginia are currently under, um, uh, have, have currently have uh, 
warning spouts of you know fishing or, or eating fish out of the rivers? Uh, I don't know the exact uh, number. That is um, uh, that is a fish tissue analysis sort of thing. And, um, so we have uh, a couple of rivers that are um, uh, for mercury. We have uh, some rivers uh, where the PCB has been found in fish tissue. Um, I, I don't know the exact uh, percentage. It's not a high percentage, but it, and it's usually in the larger portions of the river body. Yeah, I, that's, uh, when you said a couple, um, uh, Delegate, or Mr. Chair, Director Paler, when I did a quick analysis or just a quick search on uh, the list that the, the, the Commonwealth has, it was pages upon pages upon pages. For fish tissue? Uh, well, just of, of, of rivers that are, are, are contaminated with dioxin, mercury, with PCBs, um, and, and so all of these are. are, are waters and tributaries and streams and rivers in Virginia that have had chemicals dumped into them to affect the point where they're affecting our use of those rivers. And so um, I'm sure it's just a couple. Uh, well, if, if I could, um, uh, if I could reframe my answer, um, I was focusing on um, fish tissue. I would, we have about, um, Maybe 50% uh, or uh, might be a little bit higher of our water bodies are impaired. Uh -huh. Might be 60% of our water bodies are impaired. Um, and we have 100,000 miles of stream in the, in the Commonwealth. 60-65% uh, of those impairments are um, E. coli bacteria. And so it's definitely true that there are um, uh, other types of impairments um, in a significant number of streams, whether or not those have risen to the uh, fish tissue level or not, I'm, I'm not, I don't have that in my head. Okay. Thank you, Director Paler. Anyone speak in opposition to the bill? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you. Chris Pomeroy, representing the Virginia Association of Municipal Wastewater Agencies. These are the clean water utilities that you hear much about these days, undertaking the Chesapeake Bay cleanup projects, much lauded, and other efforts to uh, advance treatment of uh, domestic wastewater across the state. I mentioned domestic wastewater, uh, it, to, just to be clear, that I'll speak uh, specifically to uh, sewage sources as opposed to some of the other uh, toxic type things that have been mentioned from uh, legacy industrial uh, situations. But, um, uh, as for the bill, I'll limit my comments just to the uh, reporting uh, deadline <coughs> proposed to be reduced from uh, 24 to 12 hours. Um, you know, leave aside other portions of the bill. Um, the reason this uh, is a concern among the clean water utilities is that we have vast networks of pipe piping systems across counties, cities, and towns, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of miles of pipe with manholes uh, and pump stations. And uh, while these operators strive to do the best job they can all the time, they're, they're getting 99.999% of the wastewater to the treatment plant. I'll be the first to say that spills happen occasionally. It's part of our operations is the reason these folks uh, go to work every day. And then the question presents a real operational challenge for what we expect about these people to do in the middle of the night. Um, most of these spills are small and you know, domestic sewage, and they happen when it's raining outside. And that's important because to the list the chairman was referring to, when it's raining, pet waste, wildlife waste, uh, farm animal waste, horse waste, these things are all being washed into the streams. Not that we want to have any spills, but uh, the issue is predominantly a fecal issue, and there are multiple sources. So, Kind of the question comes, uh, in a world of limited resources, is this what you really want these utilities to redirect their resources to, um, as opposed to the other environmental pursuits that they're uh, trying to uh, pursue? These uh, notices, I think, uh, this uh, delegate guy had mentioned in the case of our member of the Hampton Road Sanitation District, they were reporting, look, we're going to try to get these things reported uh, that during the daytime hours. The question is, when something happens at 5, 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night, how is this information being collected and DEQ reports being developed 
uh, in the middle of the night. And is there much benefit, candidly, is there benefit to that administrative, to that administrative uh, work? Uh, when it uh, goes to the uh, uh, inbox or voicemail box of one of uh, the DEQ employees, are they really doing anything with this information in the middle of the night? How much effort are we going through to re reprioritize these resources <coughs> and, and the situations uh, that I'm speaking about? So um, this is a whole workforce of some of your most dedicated environmentalists, and they respectfully question uh, the effort that it will take to produce reports in these off hours. And we'd ask your consideration of maintaining the 24-hour piece of the bill, um, regardless of what you decide to do with the whole thing. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Anyone else to speak in opposition? Mr. Chairman, I'm Preston Bryan on behalf of Virginia Municipal League as well as the Virginia Water and Wastewater Authorities Association, which is 40 or 50 public service authorities. Uh, we also would have concerns about uh, lowering the 24 hour um, period. The, we don't know of any evidence that the current 40 hour period is not uh, that it's inadequate or it's not working. Um, we also note, uh, just as Mr. Palmer did, that most of these spills uh, are sewage spills in periods of heavy rain. And even in a period of heavy rain, the voluminous water, it still may, even if it's more than 8 or 10 gallons, it uh, still would be perhaps classified as the minimus. In the scheme of things, you would have folks reporting, I won't say run of the mill sewage overflows, but you know, less harmful. Of the uh, sewage oil flows and perhaps for no significant Thanks, Mr. Bryant. <coughs> Delegate Bullivant, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what I, I would like to propose an amendment, uh, I tend to agree that the, the 24 hours seems to work, and again, the, the language in there is <coughs> promptly notify, um, which says you're supposed to do it as quickly as possible, and 24 hours is just a cap. Uh, I, I don't know that that's the issue we're trying to deal with, but I, I would propose that we put lines 36 through 41 uh, and then 67 to 72 back in their original posture, and then we would be keeping, I believe, lines 93 through 102, and so I, I think we would be a good thing here, um, you know, that I was hearing from the delegate is ensuring that once that information goes over to DEQ, that number one, you expand um, the number of outlets, you know, so that you have a reasonable chance of people being able to know something that's going on in their neighborhood. Um, also, you know, I think you the flexibility with respect to de minimis, because otherwise you're going to have thousands of these things going out, and people aren't going to pay any attention. You know, we want to make sure that they have the flexibility to send out these notices when it actually is going to um, affect public health. Or, you know, those All right, we have a motion to a second. Second. Motions. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Motion carries to edit the bill. Um, is that you guys get that? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, uh, spoken to guests. I look well about that last year. I would like to speak on the bill. Sure. Um, my, my only issue that has been in the past is that the, public, the health department already has a network of delivery of, of um, health warnings. They close shellfish beds, they close beaches, they already have that network set up. If it is a health issue, then I think the health department needs to be the one disseminating the information and not really putting a DEQ into the promotion propaganda, what, you know, whatever. The, the, this, this, I, I just think that the Department of Health needs to determine <coughs> if it's a health issue, then they need to let the uh, let the uh, the people know. So that's just my, my issue with the bill now, and my issue with the bill in the past is the same. Okay. So, you get a motion, Chairman. I move for a board amendment. Second. Motion moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor, please vote on the electronic reporting board. Thank 
Thank you, Delegate Thank Trent. you so much for your time. <coughs> All right. Um, next up, Delegate Gaditis. <laughs> Delegate Gaditis, uh, HP 1464, and restrict uh, credit usage. Do you have a substitute? I do, Mr. Chairman. Oh, uh, just one um, uh, housekeeping. Uh, Delegate Lindsay has requested that we strike HB 24. So moved. Okay. All those in favor say aye. That's aye. Oh, that's a I'm sorry, I have to record that. I apologize. <coughs> All those in favor can please vote on the electronic voting board. <coughs> Also, uh, Delegate Lindsay has requested that HB 22 go aye. back today. Do have a motion? So moved. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. All right, Delegate Cadets. Mr. Chairman, do I tell you that we also have an amendment? Yes, an amendment to the substitute. And I believe so. Council. 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 The grandfather. It's in here? Yes. Okay. All right. Substitutes before us. Oh, actually, we have a motion to move, uh, move the substitute. Uh, second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Let's probably read it. Let's, let's describe right. the substitute, shall we? All right. So you've heard, you've heard about the Clark County question of nutrient credit trading and how it's eating up the best farmers in the county. Um, you've heard that the county has a lot of mountainous area. You've heard, you have not heard that the Shenandoah River runs right through the county. I, I want to assure you that we are working hard to fence the livestock off all the feeder streams off of Shenandoah. We are on board with that. We're working on it. Um, but the farming, we are within an hour and a half of metro area. We supply the farm markets. We have huge, um, we have beef and hay industries, we have a huge equine industry. If, if we eat up all the, all the hay fields and people have to go farther for hay, we've got a problem, we're creating a problem for our farmers. If, um, if we create a problem for the, the vegetable and fruit growers, we create a problem for the farm markets. Um, and I put it to you that there's something wrong in a system where a county the size of Clark County, a county like Fauquier County, is surrounded, they are adjacent to five HUCs, five HUCs, five areas that can descend upon them and buy farmland. This is an unusual situation. There are very few counties in the state that have this situation. So to the, the County Board of Supervisors came to me very worried about this. Um, there are a lot of good reasons to balance. Open space is very much environmentally friendly. I, I fight for farmland preservation. I think we need a balance here. I think in, so the substitute says, when there's a locality that is within, with adjacent to five or more HUCs than the local governing body, um, let's see, what, what can they do? Basically, they can decide which, they can restrict the total nutrient credits used. Um, the, the amendment that we put in is a grandfather clause that says that projects that are there now, projects that are in the pipeline, continue, continue through with the nutrient credit program. So, there you are. I, I'm asking for balance. I'm asking for protection. I also put it to you that even though this program is going to make a huge change in another week or so, that is not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. I heard, well, they probably won't. It's not a guarantee. We are adjacent to five of these HUCs. We're still going to be attractive. <coughs> so. All right. Thank you, uh, Delegate Kudaitis. Any questions from the committee? Delegate Guy. Is there anybody else with the Jason Paul? Delegate Guy, please direct your I'm questions sorry, to the chair. Mr. Chair, Chairman, um, would the delegate let, tell me whether how many other areas have 
five parks that are unsafe, if any. Mr. Chairman, not being an expert, um, we have looked at the maps and we identified Clark and Fakir as being adjacent to five. There are probably people in the room. We, we looked all over Virginia. We didn't see anyone else that was adjacent to five. I might be wrong, but if I'm wrong, I'm going to guess I'm only wrong for one or two more. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions for the, for the patron? All right. Anyone from the public? Oh. Delegate uh, guy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask if uh, they they can restrict. Can they restrict down to zero? Mr. Chairman, I suppose that's a possibility. But again, we have grandfathered in what's already there and the projects that are in the pipeline, and there are projects in the pipeline. Anyone uh, speak in favor of the bill from the public? I'm not going to bore you with the same thing I said before, but I strongly agree with her. And she is 100% right. As our well, 700 acres to these things, and they're not, with, with two exceptions, I believe, it is the people that own the land have done them, like the monastery, uh, which I think that's something that the county would strongly support, because what they did was, was long-term good for them and the county. <clears throat> but what's happened is, when farms are listed for sale, people from out of the county come in, buy them, and yeah, they're the landowner, but they have them in trees in 60 days. And, and as, we, as we lose our crop ground, we lose the horse industry, we lose the little dairy industry we have. Uh, we've only got a three or four dairy farms, I guess. And we also start losing our beef cattle industry because you have to either rent it or buy it from someone in a lot of people to produce hay and buy it. And when you're looking at the value, do the math on the thing I handed out at $23,000 uh, or $20,000 per pound of nutri or nitrogen, do the math on that. And it's hard for somebody to make to make that kind of money farming it. And it's not the people selling the land, it's the people buying it. There. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I add that um, it's a domino effect because most of our farmers cannot afford to buy or own this land. We are too close to the metropolitan area. We are too Sorry. beautiful. Um, and we have lots of wealthy people from the metropolitan area coming out and buying the farms. The farmers don't own the farms. They lease them. And if that if that land goes away, our farmers go away. All right. Anyone else from the, uh, the public wanting to speak in favor of the bill? Anyone from the public wanting to speak in opposition to the bill? I just remind you, you laid out your argument before. If you, if you heard it. Yes, I'm Shannon Barner here again on behalf of the Virginia Mitigation Banking Association. Um, just to address the, the changes in this bill from the other bill, my, all my other objections are here. Um, when looking at the hydrologic unit code map, um, Clark County is in hydrologic unit code 007. It is adjacent to five different parks. Um, only four of those hucks are within the Potomac River watershed. Um, we can only trade between hucks within that same watershed. So I'm assuming that she is also looking at uh, this here in the, uh, for the Rappahannock. If you take that approach throughout the Commonwealth, there are numerous localities, that are numerous hucks and localities that are going to be in that same situation where they are adjacent to five. Um, practically the entire state, <coughs> up here, you can go here. Even if you just look at four, there are a number um, within the same watershed. Um, and what her, the, the delegates bill would do would allow each different locality and numerous localities throughout the state to develop ordinances that would then restrict in the future banks' um, ability to sell the, the where they can sell those credits. We cannot make investment um, with a playing field that is going to shift from locality to locality, basin to basin, um, to do those kinds of environmental improvements that we're, we're talking about. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anyone else speak in opposition to the bill?
Oh, you follow up? Go ahead. Oh. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, subcommittee Phil Abraham, representing the Virginia Association for Commercial Real Estate. We also oppose the bill for the same reasons stated earlier. Thank you. Bill, you follow up? Mr. Chairman, um, I would like to make a motion and then speak to that motion. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'm going to move that we carry this bill over under Rule 22 to um, 2021. Um, and the reason I'm going to do that. brings uh, an important issue to the table. Um, I agree that this is not something that we ought to do jurisdiction by jurisdiction, um, but I also agree that we don't want high-quality, productive agricultural lands being consumed and in perpetuity being set aside. Um, I do think that there is um, some language in Maryland's program uh, that we might want to look at. Uh, they uh, explicitly have a safeguard in there uh, that says if you are converting ag land to a, uh, to a bank, um, that there is some kind of review process to see whether it's high quality, whether it's productive, taking a look at the, the soils to make sure that, you know, if you are converting farmland, that it's either out of production or it's going to be, you know, your less desirable stuff um, and that you're, you're not gobbling up the, the really high quality things. But that's... I, I don't see how we do that in this short period of time. Um, I don't think we would do it justice, uh, but I did want to throw that out there as the explanation for uh, why I would want to carry this over until 2021. Any motion? Can Bill? I speak to the motion? Yes, Bill, it's time. Uh, another reason I think it's a good idea is I'm really curious to see what's going to happen as we change these incentives and as the codes change to see if um, the structure does um, solve some Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Corey.